And it's almost like putting a human who would have the home range size of, you know, one mile or a little over a mile. It's like putting that human in a telephone booth for their whole life. Welcome to the Rising Lioness podcast on All About Animals Radio, a place dedicated to animals and all those who act to protect and advocate for them. Hi, I'm your host, Erica Salvamini, and I'm thrilled and honored to be here representing All About Animals Radio using my voice for the animals. Thank you for joining us for what intends to be a thought-provoking and soul-inspiring series where we discuss topics aimed at understanding the importance of the relationship between empathy, animal rights, and our peaceful coexistence with the animal kingdom. And now on to our show. In a world where wild and exotic animals belong in wild, in the wild, not confined to circuses, zoos, aquariums, or the solitude of backyards and homes, a movement is rising. It's a movement that demands compassion, respect, and freedom for all sentient beings of the earth, air, and ocean. In captivity, they're denied their natural behaviors, leading to frustration, suffering, and danger to both the animals and humans. Welcome, everyone. Today, we have Devin show with us. Devin is a campaigns associate for the Wildlife Conservation and Animal Welfare Organization, Born Free USA. Their mission is to fight against the exploitation of wild animals in captivity. Before achieving her master's in primate conservation in 2019 at Oxford Brookes University, Devin worked for several years as a primate caregiver and veterinary assistant at the Born Free USA Primate Sanctuary in South Texas. In her current role, Devin researches and writes reports on target issues, including the private trade of wild animals, wild animals in captivity, effects of social media on wild animals, the fur trade, and trapping. She also incre increases public awareness on these issues by campaigning on various platforms, including social media, blog posts, and podcasts like ours. Welcome back, Devin. It's great having you here again. Thank you. For Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Um, it's always great to have you on to talk about these important issues that are going on today with our animal friends. And today you're here to discuss one of Born Free's latest reports, which is the Oceans Away From Home report. And hopefully you can help shed some light um, for us on the lies zoos tell, which is also another one of your recent blog um, posts, which was wonderful. So let's go ahead and jump right in. And we'll start with the Oceans Away From Home report, which highlights the suffering of fish in captivity and the lack of consideration for their individuality and sentience, which is sad to say, I get, you know, it's like the totem pole of importance, I guess, in people's perception, people don't really consider fish much. I'm an animal lover, have been my whole life. I've never fished. I could never put, I couldn't even put the worm on the hook to give, you know, to, and then, you know, hook a fish's a fish mouth. But I could see how, you kind of still think, well, do they do they have thoughts? Do they have feelings? So I was hoping maybe you could tell us a little more about the challenges that fish face when kept in captivity and why their welfare is often gone overlooked. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm excited to talk about fish because um, it is our most recent report, but you're right, they are even though they are some of the most popularly kept species captively um, around the world as pets uh, and at facilities like zoos and aquariums, um, fish are the most arguably overlooked species in terms of animal welfare and animal conservation in the world. Um, and it's, it's great that we get a chance to highlight that because um, a lot of people still just don't consider fish um, to be worthy of receiving the same amount of attention that other animals do. And um, the fact of the matter is that fish face all of the same challenges that larger and better studied animals face in captivity, um, including reduced welfare and physical and mental issues due to their inability to carry out species specific behaviors in captivity. Um, so uh, 
almost all captive facilities that keep fish. Um, unfortunately, they completely ignore the fact that these animals are individuals. They are sentient. They possess naturally evolved biological needs like other animals. And they require the opportunity to engage in these species specific behaviors despite research indicating, um, well, because research indicates that they need to be able to carry out these behaviors in ways that are similar to other animals. And um, I think that this goes overlooked in large part because humans want to prioritize animals that live in similar ways that we do and look similarly to the ways that we do. Um, and for that reason, there has been this ongoing and consistent research bias that neglects fish in a lot of animal welfare research and a lot of conservation research. Um, and the fact of the matter is that's very flawed reasoning because um, we shouldn't be prioritizing certain animals because of their similarities to us. Uh, we should be valuing animals in the same ways um, regardless of how different or similar they may seem to us. Like their value should not depend on how much they relate to or are different from humans. Um, so it's really interesting. There was actually um, a study that was done that confirmed that humans think that smaller animals um, and animals that may have different lifestyles than us, so fish that live in water, animals that lay eggs, um, et cetera, like humans will prioritize those animals less and empathize with them less. Um, so that does lead to this really widespread research bias that we also see in zoos. Uh, so for example, over two thirds of all Association of Zoos and Aquariums member research has focused on mammals, uh, mostly featuring chimpanzees, elephants, gorillas, and orangutans. Um, and for the, for, for the remaining research, um, 68% of all projects were dedicated to other animals, 12% to birds, 8% to reptiles, and only 5% to fish. And the remaining 3% was amphibians, 3% invertebrates, and less than 1% to flora. Um, so this lack of research is really, um, it, it really exists in the, in the facilities that are keeping these animals as well, which is really problematic because that means that even in the facilities that claim to have expertise in keeping certain animals like fish, we really don't know all that much about them. So um, their welfare suffers as a result. Yeah, that's incredible. That's really that's fascinating. Uh, it's, you know, the public perception, as well as these places that are tasked with housing and supposedly, you know, tasked with the conservation of and the care of, you know, in places like aquariums. And so it gets to speciesism, doesn't it? So we're looking at them, you know, with our, I don't know, through a lens, they don't look like us. They lay eggs or they're, you know, they have gills. And so they're on a pecking order, which is a lot of our problems as humans. <laughs> we you know, not just the animal world, but, you know, for the non-human animal world, but also the, in the human animal world, we do the same thing. And that's why there's so many uh, problems within society, because if we don't look, if this person or that person, our neighbor, whoever doesn't look just like we do, well, that makes me feel icky or uncomfortable. And so, I mean, they're going to just not pay any mind to it you know, at the least of it. And then the worst of it is I'm, you know, I want to, I want to do harm to it because I don't understand. And so I think this report is amazing and wonderful that you guys did this to help bring some um, relatability, I guess maybe is a word to use and understanding of these, these fish and how they are sentient and they are important just like everybody else is. And so thank you. I hope everybody will look into that. Uh, the Born Free USA website will have all of these reports and all of these blog articles, right? So yes. we'll have everything posted at the end um, as we always do. So folks, if you're interested in learning more, please, I, we highly recommend that you go and check those out. And so that gets to the next question, which is something that really has been upsetting me lately. Uh, there's always something going on in the animal world. And you recently wrote this excellent piece called Octopus Farming, A Bad Idea with Terrible Consequences. And this really gets at the looming surge of octopus farming, particularly the ambitious 
plans that are unfolding in Spain right now, which is raising a lot of concerns. I was hoping you could tell us what's happening here with this development and its direct impact on octopuses, which we all know are highly intelligent beings. Um, and also tell us what this means for their populations and marine ecosystems, because it's a, it's a really big deal. Yeah, absolutely. And it really is um, multi-layered in the sense that it has impacts that can just range um, into a broad category of things. So um, it's really important that it's addressed. But uh, this issue first came to my attention in August, actually, um, when this group based in Spain came into the public view when they applied for permits mm -hmm. to operate an octopus farm. Um, that would eventually provide up to 3,000 tons of octopus meat per year, which would require the annual slaughter of about 1 million octopuses, which is um, insane. It's a lot. So um, octopus has been traditionally consumed in parts of the world, um, but uh, it has really been increasing in popularity among wealthy um, populations in specialty dishes. Uh, so it's sort of considered to be increasing in popularity in the luxury food industry uh, as of now. Um, so until recently, most of the demand for octopus meat had been satisfied by wild stocks of octopus. Um, but pretty concerningly, from 1950 to 2014, the catch of wild octopus is increased by eight times, um, with a yearly catch of almost 5 million tons, which was required back in 2014. Um, so the real issues with farming octopus in like a large scale factory uh, farm setting is that, as you mentioned, they have exceptionally high intelligence level. Um, their emotional capacity, including experiencing pain and levels of distress um, are something that would be huge to consider how that would be impacted in captivity and with such restrictions on their mobility and social behaviors. Um, they also are solitary in nature. Um, so all of these qualities together make mimicking their natural lives um, in captivity impossible. Um, so importantly, others have argued that farming octopus would be incredibly unsustainable um, in that octopuses are carnivores who require up to three times their weight and feed and would further deplete the already low fish stocks um, in the wild. Uh, there's also the concern of pollution. Um, so Octopus farms would produce nitrogen and phosphorus waste, in addition to being responsible for contaminants like fertilizers, herbicides, disinfectants. Um, and then there's also the concern that diseases could be spread from these captively held octopuses to the wild environment and those animals. Um, so as I mentioned, they are solitary. So they become aggressive and territorial when they're housed together. Um, so in facilities that have housed octopuses together in groups, there have been instances of cannibalism that have been reported. And in some cases, these high stress levels caused by these unnatural living environments has led to self cannibalism when they eat their own arms. Oh. Um, yeah, so it's really a, a complex and important issue to be discussing in all of these sort of areas that would be impacted um, of octopuses' lives. And importantly, where this would occur, um, in the EU, there's currently no rules that would protect farmed octopuses from abuse, cruelty, or neglect, or any poor housing conditions, um, because the existing animal legislation or animal welfare legislation does not include invertebrates. Um, so there's just a whole bunch there's of issues, so and it's layers. really wrong, exactly, from any way you look at it. Yeah. Um, yeah. They, they keep their the plan right so that they would be keeping a, a million octopus a year roughly that was the number i think you said is that mm -hmm. what we're talking about so it, and they're mostly solitary in nature i mean i've seen the there was a documentary um my octopus teacher and it was the following the life of this this octopus who was basically you know solitary and they're going to keep all of these octopuses on top of each other and under in like these intense lights as well, which that's not normal for them either. So we're talking about completely stressing out these animals in every possible way, putting them in a, in a condition that is very much unlike their natural environment in every possible way. So, and it sounds like, you know, factory farming in the ocean, 
So we all know what factory farming is doing in terms of pollution and taking over the land and they're, they're destroying, um, you know, forests and the Amazon and anywhere they can just deplete the land. Now they're going to do it in the ocean too and, and create these, these massive factory farms so that rich people can eat more food that they consider a delicacy and they can feel more fancy about themselves. And let's just destroy the world for it. It's basically what that boils down to. So <laughs> exactly. now I know just from doing animal advocacy work that there's a ton of petitions out there. There are millions of signatures already at this point. So, I mean, time is running out. The clock is ticking, right? The plans are in place. I know that they're chomping at the bit to make this factory farm a go in Spain. I don't know how close it is to actually, you know, flipping the switch and making it a go. I don't know if you have any of those details or if there's anything that we can do to really push ahead the animal advocacy uh, work of that. If whatever any of us can do out here, I know we would, you know, we would do it. The only thing we know to do is just keep signing these petitions, but I hope that they're not going to fall on deaf ears. And it's like, you know, the rich people and the people in power just gonna be like, ah, oh, those, those crazy tree huggers and octopus huggers, nobody, nobody cares because the rich get what they want. And I really hope that that's not the case and something will be done about this. Yeah, same here. Um, I, I don't unfortunately know the most recent updates on this, but I would say, like you said, um, if there's a petition circulating that you can sign, I would say put your name on it, um, show your support against this. And if you have any friends in the EU uh, that could speak out and um, uh, speak to changing their animal welfare legislation to include animals like octopuses, um, that would be a really great first step for sure. Yeah, and get them to try to stop eating the octopus. I mean, on honestly it's just it's what needs to be done if you know lead from your heart i know it's not easy to make these big changes in life but in order to to do it it's got to start one person at a time so um well thank you thank you for that that bit um you know giving a little bit to the octopus and so from there let's move from the oceans to zoos and aquariums and in the lies zoos tell you discuss lacking care or concern for the animals in some of these facilities. And I was wondering if you could please explain some of the key issues regarding animal welfare in zoos. Yeah, sure. So broadly speaking, um, since these issues vary between species a lot, um, welfare issues in captivity for wild animals mostly stem from the lack of space that is provided in captivity. Um, many animal species roam several miles per day um, in the wild, which just simply cannot be mimicked in captivity. Um, and so a lot of uh, mental and physical issues actually stem from that lack of physical, the lack of physical activity, um, the inappropriate diet they might have, um, inability to re recreate complex social and familiar structures that they're used to in the wild and they've evolved to thrive in. Um, and the inability to replicate the amount of mental stimulation these animals would have in the wild. Um, and the restriction of so many behaviors often results in excessive levels of boredom, depression, apathy, stress. And then this in turn will result in um, the manifestation of stereotypical behaviors, um, which are uh, sort of behaviors that animals will engage in to, in efforts to reduce their stress level. Um, and they are functionless usually, um, but it provides some relief to them by carrying out these behaviors. Um, so that can be something like pacing or rocking themselves, plucking their own hair, um, things like that. OCD. So, exactly. Yeah. 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 A lot of them do resemble that, that type of um, mental state. So um, another problem that we see is that uh, the prevalence of potentially fatal diseases and other health issues um, will result from all of these restrictions that are prevalent in captive environments. So something like um, EEHV, which in elephants is elephant endotheliotropic herpes viruses. Um, so in Asian elephants, this is considered one of the leading causes of death 
in captive Asian elephant populations in the world. Um, and the chance of spreading and contracting EEHV is actually exacerbated by captive conditions like the high stress levels that accompany a new individual coming into a new herd or removing an individual from a herd and transferring them to another facility um, or weaning a young, uh, a juvenile uh, earlier than they would be weaned from their mother in the wild. Um, and also places that have more active breeding programs have a uh, higher um, uh, susceptibility rate to EEHV for their elephants. So um, all of these things are related uh, and the core thing is the captive environment and the added stresses of a captive environment that exacerbate all of these issues for these animals. Yeah, stress. Stress is a killer. We, as humans, know this, and it, the animals are no different. So that's really heartbreaking. And um, all roads are leading to one place, which is, you know, sh should animals be kept held captive in zoos? And, you know, so on the, on the flip side of this, we have these accredited facilities who are trying to replicate natural habitats for animals, but even the best zoo settings do fall short. And so is it justifiable? That is the question, right? What What's the answer? So the answer is no. Yeah. Um, it's impossible to replicate every wild animal's natural environment, activity level, um, social structure. Just there is no way to do that. Um, there is just simply not enough space or resources to achieve this for every facility. Um, zoo guidelines are often based off of what is available to the zoos and what is more appealing to the visitors rather than what the animals actually need, unfortunately. Um, so it's also important to note that even the Association of Zoos and Aquariums or the AZA, those standards for zoos are, they're often claimed to be like the gold standard for all zoos. They, they claim to be the best and have the best guidelines in terms of what's right for the animals. Um, but even the AZA guidelines are incredibly neglectful of the welfare of the animals they keep. Um, so for example, uh, we found through research for our reports, um, in North America, the AZA has recommended a minimum enclosure size of 0.12 of an acre per elephant, which to put that in perspective is less than twice the size of a doubles tennis court. Um, so the minimum European outdoor enclosure space is a bit larger, but that still is 4,600 times smaller than the smallest reported wild home range size for elephants. Um, so also for many animals like fish, we discovered the AZA has no welfare or spatial requirements whatsoever, um, including for things like fish tanks, or I'm sorry, <laughs> yeah, for fish tanks, but also for things like touch tanks, um, where these animals are basically constantly exposed to physical contact with people, which of course increases stress levels, increases the trans the potential to transmit zoonotic diseases to fish and also to humans. Um, and there's really no um, regulation of these touch tanks and it's incredibly harmful to the fish welfare um, because they're essentially not required to be given a break. So they could be in this touch tank all day long, exposed to humans, exposed to light, um, without enough space to move around, uh, crammed in with a bunch of other individuals, not, none of these things are regulated. So it's just really unfortunate um, for the animals. And I, I guess I will give you one other example that is probably the most extreme example of this, which is polar bears. Um, we published a report summarizing the issues of polar bears in captivity a few months ago. And um, the issue with them, there are many issues, but one of the main ones is the temperature. Um, the average temperature in the Arctic during the summer is below 50 degrees Fahrenheit, whereas the average temperature in July in US zoos that keep polar bears is 74 degrees. Um, so this alone is incredibly stressful and physically um, exhausting for polar bears. Um, and again, wild polar bears have annual home range sizes of up to several tens of thousands of square miles. Um, and in 2003, it was reported that the typical zoo enclosure for a polar bear was 0 0.23 acres. And this is equivalent to about one millionth the size of their minimum home range size in the wild. So you can imagine the restriction, the level of restriction on these animals is incredibly um, 
stressful and that causes a myriad of other issues. Um, and it's almost like putting a human who would have the home range size of, you know, one mile or a little over a mile. It's like putting that human in a telephone booth for their whole life. Right. So it's just, it's, it's, it's a really living hell. It's a living hell. Exactly. I, I, exactly. Can't, I can't even fathom how these animals are living as long as they are. And that, you know, more tragedy has not ensued as a result. I, I just, it's really unfathomable. It's unconscionable that we're doing this and it just, it has to change. I, you know, I recently interviewed Leif Cox, who's got 30 years in as a veteran in wildlife conservation. He, he has several wildlife organizations under his belt and he started out as a zookeeper and he's got 12 years, he had 12 years in this field. And so I felt compelled to ask him about this before we got to talking about the Sumatran tigers, um, which is what he had come on for. And he shared the zoos industry's justification for keeping animals captive as the, the normal that they say, which is awareness, education, and holding backup populations, you know, the just in case for the critically endangered species. But Leif said plainly, he's like, this is simply flat out not true. And he stated, and I quote, zoo populations are unsustainable and will collapse eventually. It may be difficult to save these endangered species in the wild. The operative word is difficult, but it is impossible to save them in captivity. And, you know, like Leif and many of us, we hope that zoos are evolving beyond being menageries of, you know, a, a, a menagerie of animals to a place of conservation. But it begs the question, are they? Is that really what's happening? Is that really what they are? And so I guess you've already answered this question, Devin. Um, but you know, what do you think about what Leif said and the the fact that this is just unsustainable? And you know, what are we looking at here? What's going to happen? What should we be doing? Yeah, no, he is completely right. Um and it it's crazy how this honestly this lie by zoos has been perpetuated for so long and the general public still believes genuinely believes that by visiting zoos and seeing these animals live their entire lives in captivity um that is somehow helping these wild populations increase their numbers and that is just simply not true um so he's correct zoo populations are incredibly unsustainable and um, some do not even meet the genetic diversity requirement put forth by the AZA simply because continuously breeding animals in captivity will result in a less genetically diverse population than animals breeding in the wild without the same restrictions. Um, they're so even, they're even culling them. Like I never knew that they bred yeah. animals in mm -hmm. zoos. They breed them and then they're like, oops, we have too many. Let's just, Correct. the vet comes in. I don't yep. know what kind of veterinarian, I mean, that's what you go to, to school for is to euthanize mm -hmm. young, healthy, perfectly fine animals. Mm -hmm. because there's not enough room at the end. And exactly. And a lot of people don't know that either. Like the only time I think that was really brought into the knowledge of the general public was when Marius, um, the giraffe yes. uh, over in Europe had been um, killed. They like to use the word euthanized right. but that's just inaccurate because in that situation they're murdering you are not putting an animal out of their misery you're not doing it for um the welfare of the animal to to help them you're you're killing them uh when they don't need to be killed mm -hmm. um so uh i think uh an important case study to highlight for this unsustainability issue really um, in zoos is captive elephants, uh, because from our research, we know that more deaths than births have occurred in, in the UK and North America in the last 20 years, um, with wild import being the only consistent method used in attempts to grow these captive population numbers. Um, and projections indicate that without imports from the wild, the European captive elephant population will cease to exist by 2045. Um, so it's, it's just, it's crazy that the zoos are claiming that they are improving elephant conservation when in reality, they're actually removing individuals from the wild to import them 
to keep in their captive collections. And these elephants that they import uh, into the UK, into North America, elsewhere, they will. these elephants will never live in the wild. Their descendants that are bred in captivity will likely never experience a wild environment because the resources needed to transport elephants from the United States to their native environments, those are that's a crazy amount of resources and uh, money required to do something like that. So the idea that they are going to release these captive populations as reserve populations um, at some point in the future is just not feasible. Right. And on top of that, I mean, by breeding populations in captivity, um, generation after generation, these animals that have only known captivity for their whole lives will not be able to survive in the wild, right? right? The only animals that have a successful reintroduction rate into the wild are those that are um, born and raised in their natural environment, um, which is within their native range state. Um, and they are adequately prepared to live in the wild and fend for themselves. And that is not at all what zoos do. Right. Um, and a couple other things I just wanted to bring up is that um, in, in 1990, the uh, IUCN or the International Union for the Conservation of Nature um, identified survival plans for 1,370 species. And only 1.4% of that or 19 species were identified as being candidates for reintroduction of captive bred animals. Wow. Um, so that means that zoos that have, you know, these animals that aren't even necessarily endangered, because I think only maybe less than 10% of the animal species that zoos have are actually endangered to some extent. Um, it is not recommended by the most recognized organization uh, in the world for helping increase, you know, the conservation status of animals in the wild. It's not recommended by this organization to captively breed these animals. That's not what they recommend. They recommend other things in their native environment, which would be things like uh, reducing poaching, um, tightening legislation that would uh, limit the trade of these animals, um, doing things in their environment that would help improve and protect the population there. It's not focused on captively breeding these um, quote reserve populations that zoos are so adamant about doing. That's just not a recommendation. Um, so it's just really, it's crazy that, you know, this is still an argument that is being touted by zoos. Um, and actually one more kind of stat I wanted to provide you with, um, because I think these are really important for people to know about just the numbers, the numbers that are true um, is that in the last century, only 16 of 145 reintroduction programs worldwide ever actually restored any animal populations in the wild. And of those, most were carried out by government agencies and not zoos. So 16 zoos really out of how many? 16 out of 145 reintroduction programs ever actually restored any animal populations to the wild. And of those, you know, most were carried out by the government agencies, not zoos. Right. So, so they're um, lying. it's it's the big yeah. lie. It really is. That was uh, an incredible um, report or blog that you put together. And the title of it could not be more true because, you know, it, and it does, it comes back down to money. You know, these zoos are just an industry. It's just a business making money and it's not about the welfare of the animals. So um, folks listening, I'm pretty sure that most of our audience is already on board and understand and they know the, you know, what it means to be an animal advocate. And so they're probably not going to the zoo. But if you are, please consider what you're spending your money on and what you're giving it to. It's the suffering of animals. And just because it's always been done one way doesn't mean that that's the way it should still continue to be done. We are, you know, we have brains in our heads. We're supposed to be thinking and rationalizing and coming up with uh, new, better ways to live. And so to that, I wanted to ask also, um, because there's numerous findings in your field, as well as within the realm of conservation and animal sciences that underscore the paramount significance of family structures within the natural environment. And 
Can you explain how captivity settings affect these natural family dynamics and the consequences that they're having for these animals? Yeah, of course. Um, so due to the capacity and funding restraints that zoos have, um, they will often transfer young animals to other zoos and separate them from their mothers, um, sometimes at ages younger than this separation would naturally occur in the wild, um, which can affect the dynamics of an existing group significantly. Um, so I do keep coming back to elephants, but I feel like they are one of like polar bears. They're one of the most extreme examples of this in captivity um, because the loss of a family member for elephants uh, it's incredibly hard to cope with, and it will affect the mental and physical health of the individuals experiencing this loss for a significant amount of time after that loss is initially felt. Um, so to bring up another species like uh, giraffes, herd sizes can be as large as 175 individuals in the wild. Um, and the average herd size is typically three to nine individuals. Um, but of course, the opportunity to form these types of societies in captivity are severely limited. Um, so through our research, we discovered that North American zoos um, participating in the AZA currently hold about five giraffe per facility. Um, but troublingly, when we kind of broke that down, we found that 36 zoos reported holding three or fewer giraffes. Um, which is about 35% of all the AZA zoos that keep giraffe and 12 zoos held only two giraffes and then two zoos held only one giraffe. So um, these opportunities for uh, engaging in normal social interactions and having normal social structure, which is really integral in having good welfare as anyone, as a human, as an animal, um, these are really severely, these opportunities are really severely denied to all animals in zoos. Um, but those are just a couple of the species that experience it at perhaps the highest extent. But the same is true, true for primates. Um, lots of primate species stay with their mothers for uh, at least the first two years of their lives. Many stay with their mothers for their entire lives in the wild. So um, it, all of these dynamics are, really difficult to replicate in captivity. And most of the time it is very far from what is natural for these animals. Yeah, it's being completely overlooked and it's it's just, they don't think about it or just don't care. It's like, well, the, the, the animals are considered a commodity and they serve a purpose and that purpose is to be exploited for money. And that's just really heartbreaking and, um, let's let's move on to um like the aquarium setting so blackfish was a documentary focusing on tilikum an orca involved in the deaths of three people and it examines his capture in 1983 in time at sea land um in the pacific where he endured harassment from other captive orcas and the film challenges sea world's claims about captive orcas lifespans it also highlights the extreme stress and what uh, in wild what orcas and the aggression that they can have in captivity. How do you think that Blackfish, the documentary, changed the public perception of the treatment of captive whales and dolphins? Did it make a difference? Mm -hmm. I do. I think it brought attention to how large the discrepancy is between the quality of lives of animals in the wild versus the quality of lives of animals in captivity. Um, I would love this exact same documentary to be done for every species that's kept in captivity. I think it was very powerful for people to actually really see um, how much these animals were suffering. Um, especially with that graphic, I think it showed, you know, um, how much larger the parking lot at SeaWorld was than the orca or the dolphin enclosures. Um, and then how much smaller that is compared to their range size in the wild. Um, and looking at graphics like that, direct comparisons really shows that it's such a massive and incredibly sad difference. Um, and I think the thing that the general public still needs to understand is that this is a horrible truth for all wild animals kept in captivity. Um, so 
it's it's something I think that needs to be applied to all species, not just marine mammals, which have gotten a lot of um, attention in the past years, some in some part because of this documentary. Um, but I think it needs to go beyond just those groups of animals for mm -hmm. sure. Um, and I think it's also important to note that the interaction experiences with wild animals are also incredibly dangerous for both the animals and the humans. So like uh, the orca training and the dolphin training that was going on um, because a wild animal's natural tendency to be aggressive and unpredictable is only heightened in captivity because as we've been talking about, their stress levels are so much higher and their fear of humans is so much lower because they've been habituated to humans since they were young. So they no longer have sort of a natural fear of people um, like they would in the wild. So, I mean, just recently, like a few weeks ago, a rhino at a zoo in Austria um, attacked a married zookeeper couple and killed the woman and seriously injured the man. And these were both experienced um, certified zookeepers. And uh, this happened because the woman was in open contact with the rhino and she was putting insect uh, repellent on the rhino. Mm -hmm. um, um. So yeah, just, it's really sad and tragic. Um, and this has happened, unfortunately, um, numerous times with wild animals in zoos killing experienced people like zookeepers that have been doing this for years veterinarians um so we really have to take a look at why we're still doing this with so much evidence pointing to the fact that it's not right it's not natural um and this environment only exacerbates those dangers unfortunately right absolutely i i could not agree more well Devin, maybe you can help help us leave on a hopeful note here and give some advice to our listeners on how they can become real advocates for wild animals. What should we be doing out here? Yeah, I think one of the most important things to do is really to find the truth um, about something. I think in this age of social media and misinformation that is constantly being spread, especially about wild animals um, online, I think it's really important for individual people to kind of take the power into their own hands and really dissect um, the animal industries that are thriving today and um, find out the facts for yourself. Don't rely on places to, to give you those facts, um, especially the zoo and aquarium industry, because we know um, ever since they've been founded, they have essentially been fabricating the truth um, not being 100% honest and in why they should be justified to keep um, keep these animals. So um, I think it's really important to do your own research and come to your own conclusions and um, fight for those truths that you find through that. Yeah, beautifully put. I, I couldn't agree more. And to that, I say, as we conclude today's episode, we've delved into the profound challenges faced by animals in captivity, the depletion of our oceans, and the ethical questions surrounding these practices. But beyond the facts and figures, we're left with a deeper question. What choices are we willing to make in our own lives, knowing that we can profound, that, that those choices can profoundly impact the well-being of wildlife, our planet, and all sentient creatures that we share it with? It's a question that invites empathy, compassion, and reflection. And so we hope that our discussion has sparked a desire for some positive change in the hearts and minds of others. And I thank you all today for being a part of the Rising Lioness, where we explore paths towards a more compassionate world for us all. Thank you, Devin, again, for coming on. I so enjoy our conversations, and I do leave with a hopeful heart that people like you and the work that Born Free USA is doing is making a tremendous difference. I know that it is. And I look forward to our next talk together. So I'll just say, see you later. And thank you. And thank you audience for, for coming on today and listening in and have a beautiful day, everyone. Namaste. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye. This has been Erica Salvamini for the Rising Lioness podcast on All About Animals Radio. 
A special thank you to Chris Corley for generously lending us his song, Zero Gravity, for the Rising Lioness podcast theme. Please take a moment to write a review for our show as it helps others to find us. Please also support our guests and their work, All About Animals Radio and our social networks. Doing this further supports the animals and their advocates too, thereby making you an Animal Kingdom warrior also. You can find our links on the Rising Lioness podcast page. Until next time, in the words of Sharon Nunez, Animal Equality President, remember this. The small actions of one passionate individual can create a butterfly effect leading to a movement that has the power to change the world. Please use your voice for the animals today.